Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are ready to start the last day of the, the workshop. It's my great pleasure to introduce the invited speaker that starts this, uh, this day, Professor Marcus Bukeridge, who is uh, currently a, a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Professor Marcus Bukeridge was a researcher at the Institute of Botany for 20 years here in Sao Paulo, uh, in the city of Sao Paulo. He was also a director a uh, scientific director in CTBE, which is a national lab for research in bioethanol in Campinas, at San Pain. Uh, he was one of the founders of the BioN program uh, of FAPESP, the, 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 the FAPESP program for, two, for studies on bioenergy, and he, where he was also a coordinator. Uh, besides, he's uh, one of the few Brazilian members of IPCC and uh, he's the director of the uh, INCT of bioethanol, which is uh, an important uh, initiative from the federal government. Besides that, he's a great friend, and uh, it's really a pleasure to have someone from the bio, bio, from the bio side who is one of the most uh, enthusiastic people and a person I know on mathematical and computational methods in order to try to solve problems on his field. Thank you very much, Max, for, for accepting this invitation. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Uh, everything that Roberto said is, uh, well, the, the truth is really that we are great friends, uh, and Roberto is a great collaborator of, of our team. Uh, I'm a biologist, so I, I, in advance I will, I will ask for forgiveness for some of the naive mathematics that we'll talk about, but I'm really enthusiastic with that, and I think computational biology is, is the future. Uh, so, uh, first, my, my main core of research is how plants function, plant physiology. And this is a little bit of the history of uh, plant physiology, uh, showing you how certain techniques and computational biology is up here uh, completely changed the way we look at how plants function, how plants work. And uh, we are now living in the, in the omics era, as you, as you all know. We are sequencing genomes, complete genomes, looking at the expression of genes and uh, interacting these with the metabolomics as well. So the proteomics, metabolomics, all this omics mean that we have big data. We have a lot of data to deal with. And uh, how to integrate this data, I think, is the, is the main, is the main uh, issue. In, the, in, in, this, in this era. So we, uh, it, the way to integrate that is using systems biology, using general system theory, so looking at how the systems integrate to each other. And uh, also, by doing that, we, and understanding how information flows inside the plant, we could do a thing called synthetic biology. That is, produce a plant or an animal that would do things that they not normally would do. So with that, it could develop a completely different technology. And maybe in the future, we, we will have plant, plants are factories, plants that will produce the kind of materials and substances that we need, and even artificial life. Maybe we can create a different way uh, of uh, producing life. Um, this is the first. So my talk, uh, the, the the goal of all, everything that we, we, we are doing in my lab is related to better production of food, to how plants deal with the environment, especially the, gl the global climate change, how plants respond to global climate change, and also related to the production of renewable energy. Uh, I hope I can show you, I will, what I will do is to show some uh, uh, case studies that I hope I can integrate in the end so that you will, you will understand how these connect to, uh, to each other. Um, so, 
the flow of information inside the plant is made primarily by one atom, uh, in fact, two atoms. There are many of them, but carbon, how plants deal with carbon, where when they take carbon, CO2, from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, where is this carbon going? As this carbon flows through the plant, it tells the organ or the cell where it is going, I'm here, and by telling I am here, I'm arriving here, and the flow, the, how much carbon arrives there, will trigger several signals in different organs that will send some messages back to other places. So if you, if you look carefully, plants may be even intelligent beings, right? May be like a brain that is not centralized, a brain that is exploded, but communication is there. And now part of my talk will be about that. Uh, well, let's quickly look at this. Uh, this is the integration of the plant. You have to remember that the main factors that plants are reading in the environment are light, water, CO2, and temperature. It reads these all the time in the atmosphere and also in the soil. In the soil, you have the nutrients, you have the water that is coming in, and you have the microorganisms. Plants communicate with microorganisms. Actually, microorganisms live inside the plant and exchange information uh, with the plant. This is called endophytic microorganisms. So it's a very, very complex system if you look, if you look carefully. Plant, the, the plant itself, the, the, the body of the plant, is made of cells and tissues, and these tissues are made of molecules which are made of atoms. So the question is how the, uh, the, 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 the scales correlate to each other. Uh, inside the plants. So, for example, when a CO2 enters the leaf, uh, this is one molecule that can tell lots and lots of things about how, what the tissue in the root is, is going to have to do in, in the next day or in, in, even in that very night. Okay, flow of information. So, say you have a plant uh, that is reading what is going on in the soil and in the atmosphere. So, the, the plant is receiving signals, right? And there is a, re a reception system, and this reception system will operate by producing, for example, uh, RNAs. RNAs are the molecules that uh, are, are transcribed from the DNA, from the code. The DNA is just the code. The code is transcribed to to RNA, and RNA is translated to proteins, and the proteins will operate and make the metabolism. You are now sitting here, and your brains are working because of that, right? All the time, very quickly, everything is integrating. Uh, then uh, there is this new issue that is epigenetics. So in fact, the plants are not, or the organisms uh, are not really expressing RNAs, but they, they, they is like, if the DNA is expressing everything, but there is these mechanisms, these mechanisms like epigenetics that are suppressing the expression of the genes that are not necessary. So this, this, this is very interesting new field, uh, which is very important for us if we think of computing biology. But the, 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 the signal, signal transduction within the plant will, can change development. Cell fate, if, this, if the, an organ or the entire plant will leave or die, for example, many parts of the plant can die, like a plant can throw, throw out a, a leaf or a flower. So there is life and death occurring all the time, and this is due to communication. So this, this ends up being something that we call phenology. For example, we are here in the, in the tropical stational uh, deciduous the forest where the leaves will fall due to the decrease of temperature and the decrease of water. In the northern hemisphere, you see by, by mainly by the temperature and also because of the lack of water, the leaves will fall, but for different reasons. And the plants, somehow they know they, where they are from. It's like if they had a culture, for example, right? Okay, information. 
I think you all know that, but this is a biologist's uh, view of that. So communication means that you have, you have to have a source of information that is, the, as I said, primarily the temperature and the, and the CO2 and water, and then you have a message. This message is, uh, to, uh, you, you, you need a transmitter to transmit this message, and you have interference. Interference in, in language can be, for example, semantic, semantic barriers. I can be here telling you something, and because of the semantics I'm using, you are, you're having something different in your mind, right? That's sem semiotics, right? That's the, the process of semiosis in the brain of every one of you could be different from what, uh, what I'm, is in my brain. So plants may have semi semiosis, biological semiosis. This is discussed in the literature. The receptor, the signal is received by a receptor, and then it goes to the final destination. So this is the, the way I think about information. Now, if we look more deeply inside the biology, this is an example of how plants in general would respond to the global climate change. So if, if I increase CO2, for example, this is just for CO2, the plants have this stomata that are thousands and thousands of little mouths, usually in, in, the, in the downside of the leaf, that we will open every morning and allow CO2 to enter. As it allows CO2 to enter, it loses water. So there is a trade-off here. And this, uh, what happens here, the stomata will open, and the stomata will open, and then the carbon, uh, that, the carbon from the CO2 will be transformed into sucrose, sugar, and the sugar will be transported to a leaf, for example, and produce this uh, beautiful grain here that is starch, right? It stores starch or just sends the sugar to the root and to, to other places in the leaf. When we, when we put a plant to grow in elevated CO2, what we see is an increase in photosynthesis, the electron transport system, that is the system that takes light, takes the energy of light and connects the energy, this energy with the processing of the carbon to produce the sugars, uh, will be changed, like it will be in, uh, improved. And then by doing that, the leaf will deal better with water because it will lose less water, right? The stomata can be uh, not so open, and the carbohydrate status of the leaf is better, it produces more, more sugar, and so on and so forth. So respiration goes up, there is all a signal system that will, if, if the carbon is too much, what the plant is going to do is to switch off the photosynthesis, to decrease photosynthesis, to acclimate to the situation. This is one of the things. The other thing, and I'll show you what, the, what a plant can do, is to, when it developed when we develop a new leaf, when it is growing in elevated CO2, it can produce a leaf with a lower number of stomata. Right? So there is a communication system inside the plant. That's, that's why I, uh, I, I put that there. The information is the most important uh, information that I would like to give you today. Our, our lab is called La Fieco, the uh, physiological... Uh, laboratory of Plant Ecophysiology, uh, University of Sao Paulo, and we have been dealing with several different species, as I told you, species related to uh, Phaseolus vulgaris, for example, that is food, sugarcane, that is bioenergy, soybean is food or feed, and uh, several species from the Atlantic forest to understand, to understand the biomes, and also plants from the Amazon as well like this one here, Matapasto, which is bioenergy, and uh, acai pound, that is food. Uh, not going. Uh, what we want to understand with that, and this, this is very important because I have to connect this later on, uh, the mission is to understand the flux, flux of information inside the plant, the variables that we can change in the laboratory, CO2, water and temperature. The techniques, techniques that we use are within the domain of the biochemistry, metabolomics and metabolism of sugars, molecular biology as well, measuring gene expression, for example. And we deal with native species, trying to understand how plants will respond to, to a changing environment is not only uh, global climate change, but changing environment, and how to control systems in the crop, in the crop species, how to control systems interaction. 
to apply this to synthetic biology. In the bioenergy side, we, there is a project that we have in the laboratory that is called the supercane project. That we, we think that we can now transform the plant in many different parts so that we could really make the plant to work differently. But this is very tricky and we will need a lot of computational biology for that. Uh, I'll show you one example that is the Hymenea corboreo is a big tree that occurs from the Amazon, actually from uh, Mexico up to Sao Paulo. Uh, and to illustrate the, the problem, uh, I'll show you a film that we made several years ago. Uh, we wanted to understand Deixa em loop, por favor. Ou então vai passando ela, vai clicando e vai passando de novo. So, what we wanted to understand here is very simple thing. What happens here? You see that this, this uh, young plant, that those are baby plants, seedlings uh, growing. So we detached the cotyledons and you can see that there is a big difference in the size of the plant. So we wanted to study these reserves that is in the cotyledon. That was very simple, very simple plant physiology. Proximal. So uh, physiologically, we can just measure, for example, the dry weight of the cotyledon and see that the dry weight after 40 days will go down, whereas the, the seedling is growing. You can see that, all that in the film, but I have to, to put numbers on it for you to understand. Another way to look at that, actually look really, is to cut the cotyledon and see that the reserve that is there in the, in the cell wall, this is the inside of the cell and this is the cell wall, is eaten by the system and this is the carbon that makes the plant grow. So this is simple plant physiology. As I promised in my, in my, in my summary, uh, this is uh, the story why we, we studying this system. Uh, it became more and more complex. Uh, we ended up looking at the biochemistry of that and uh, we found that this polysaccharide, this, this, this reserve is a polysaccharide in the, in the wall. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the biochemistry for you, but it's just to understand that this, this polymer is degraded by several different enzymes and will produce free sugars, glucose, xylose, galactose, that will be used for the plant as a source of carbon to grow. Then we continued to look at that and we found, for example, that it, Look, this part occurs during the night, and this part occurs during the day. Things became more and more complex. As we did that, we also started to look at, at this, the chemical structure of this polysaccharide, and we actually found that polysaccharides may have a code, just like the DNA and the proteins. And we, 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 made, we made proof of that. So we are, we are looking after that now. And we are going to have to use compute, computing biology for that, computational biology for that. So we ended up with this uh, idea that uh, uh, the plant, you have the seedling. You have the seedling growing. You have photosynthesis. Photosynthesis produces sucrose. Sucrose uh, is also produced by the cotyledons. CO2 is entering there. So during the day, what is happening is that photosynthesis is working, right? And the, we found one of these signals that is this IAA, that's a plant hormone that is sent by, by the plant, by the leaves, is sent to the cotyledon saying, I, I'm growing. I'm growing. Send me sucrose. Okay? This is the message that this is saying. Then during the day, this is almost disappeared. So the plant is using photosynthesis. And uh, during the night, during the night, uh, photosynthesis is obviously not on. So sucrose is not going. And the plant is communicating mostly with the cotyledons. This is a plant that eats carbon 24 hours a day. Right? instead of using just photosynthesis. And this is the reason why these plants grow so fast. We have now another plant from the Amazon that we are working with that produces seedlings that are this, this size. 
because they grow very, very uh, uh, quickly because they use these sugars to escape flooding in the Amazon when the flooding is coming, for example. So we ended up with that, and it became more and more complex, right? So we have a biochemistry, uh, all the signaling, all the signaling mechanisms. We found that red light is involved, blue light is involved. Not only not only the photosynthetic light. Many we found many of the genes related. So we started to see this network becoming more and more complex. Uh, it's difficult. We also grew these plants in elevated CO2. We have these chambers in our laboratory. That is, uh, we can increase the CO2. We double the concentration of CO2. You can see the, the hymenia, the jatoba, growing, growing inside of CO2. And we found a few things. You can imagine that I have a, uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of data uh, on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm just showing you a few of them. Vou, vou começar a falar para você. Next, please. Yeah. One thing that we found is uh, one thing that we found is that the plants seem to become obese when they grow in elevated CO2. They they have much more starch, as you see here, to the point that they can, they can even destroy some of the chloroplasts. So this is a symptom of the global climate change that could be quite important in the future. Próximo. Uh, then we, we also grew in elevated temperature, and you can see that when you combine elevated temperature with elevated CO2, the plant will grow even, fast, uh, even faster, right? Next. Uh, you remember that the CO2 is going here, you remember that I told you uh, that plants will decrease the stomata when they grow in elevated CO2. They enter here, this is the... the down part of the leaf, and this is the, where the, the chloroplasts are and the surface of the leaf, proximal. So we, we found that the, the stomata is really decreasing when, when we, we put the plants in elevated CO2. Then we started to imagine that, well, well, if this is happening now when I make the experiment, it's possible that this is already happening since the beginning of the 20th century. And we looked for leaves that were, were collected in, uh, 19, uh, próximo, in, 19, in 1919 and 1929. Próximo. Próximo. And what we found is that really there were much more stomata in the past than there is now. When we look at that 1929, próximo, we found this. So stomata is already decreasing, and this is already a symptom of uh, plant. The plant is reading the environment since the beginning of the 20th century. Now we have uh, five species, including this one. And for, for this one, we already have a collection made in 1870. So we want to see what was going on there. Next. So looks like plants may be intelligent, right? Because they are reading the environment in the long term, in the short term, every day, they, uh, the 24 hours or even in minutes, plants can change the behavior depending on the environment. So I started to look at the definitions of intelligence. So acquaintance, intercourse, familiarity, information communicated, uh, news notice. This is from, uh, from an English dictionary, right? I think it's Collins, I don't remember who it is. Uh, the capacity to know and understand, readiness to comprehension, etc., etc. It's, it's linked to humans, but people that define intelligence, they are very careful to define intelligence so that it's not only human. Intelligence is uh, wider than human. So I started to think whether plants could be intelligent, and then uh, one idea was to look at the uh, próximo, was to, to look at uh, mathematics and see artificial intelligence. What what these guys in artificial intelligence were talking about? So and I, I started to read. I, I stumbled in this book that is fascinating for me from John Holland. That's called Emergence. Uh, and then uh, he uses very simple ex in the beginning very uh, very simple example of. Um, of um, uh, chess playing, for example, that you have a s different strategies and you have an evaluator of the strategy and you have a predictor of the, uh, uh, of the strategy and then you move a selector and you choose an, an, another strategy so that you have game, the game happening. Next, 
If you look now at artificial intelligence, this is another thing that we found. If you look at, a, 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 at an artificial neuron, it obeys the Hebb's law. So as higher the stimulation, the neuron will, will be stimulated until it gets into fatigue. Okay? So if I have, for example, two inputs, input one and input two, and the output, and if I look, the you look at the combination of the two inputs and what is the output, I, I would have this output here. Okay? Bear this in mind. If now I have three neurons instead of one, and I have two inputs again, and these neurons interact, the output would change in this position, for example. So that's fine. If plants work like that, uh, could be intelligence. However, if you take this output, Proximo, if you take this output and use this as a source of input, then you see something that, in a very simple way, that is memory. So I ask myself, would plants have memory? And we try to do some experiments. Proximo. First, if plants had memory, they would be able to recognize patterns as we actually see in nature, right? How John Holland says we recognize patterns. We don't see the whole. We see, for example, in a triangle, we would see the vertices of the triangle uh, so that we first see A and then we see B and then we see C and then we eliminate the interactions and then we know that is a triangle. So it's a very simple way of looking and uh, save that in your mind, that looking just at certain things, I should be able, a plant should be able to recognize a pattern. Proximo. So we, we started doing some uh, neural networks, for example, we did an experiment with Hymenia measuring photosynthesis twice per week during a year, and uh, in collaboration with the uh, Polytechnics. Next, please. Proximo. Aprala. So, using the neural networks, we, we discovered that we can forecast what will be the photosynthesis within a year with 10% error in relation, we separated the data like people do, and with the fuzzy logic, when we applied fuzzy logic, we got to 5%, right? So, this, this is, intelligent by its, uh, is, is interesting by itself, and these connections that plants made, I was trying to think of uh, a theory of uh, formalization for that, and uh, I came up with this thing that I call connection firing mechanism. This, this, is, this would be the basic mechanism for environmental semi semiosis. The environment has variables that are connected to metabolism, uh, and, and these variables are this... Uh, 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 light, temperature, water, and CO2, and gene expression, enzyme action, molecular action will, give, will determine the behavior of the plant. So, to look at the memory, we, we knew that uh, the, the, the plant behave, uh, the photosynthesis behave in a, in a way that I can forecast what is going to happen, but there is memory. If a plant, for example, that's, uh, that's not Hymenia, that's uh, Pau Brasil, uh, it's a symbol of the country that gave the name of Brazil. Uh, if I take one plant and put this plant inside a forest, where it cannot see the full light, but it has all the complications of all the leaves that are moving, right? I have something uh, that you can see here, when you see light here, the blue, it's called sunfleck. In a certain time, the sun will cross and will go to, for example, from zero, will go to 500 micromoles per square meter per second of light. So there is a train of, uh, of waves that will arrive in the surface of the leaf, right? So there is one train here, another train here, another train here. If now you look at the photosynthesis, in the first train that is quite high, plants will not respond. When the second train arrives, right, there will be a huge response. And then after that, plant, the plant understood that this is, this is coming, changed the proteins in the surface, and synchronized photosynthesis with the environment. So, is this a decision mechanism? Is this intelligence? We don't know. 
Okay, plants may have a memory. Do they have a language? If they can, can we read what plant is saying? Usually women can do that, right? In the house, they can look at the plant and say, you need water, and then, you, know, you need more light, let me move you, right? This, this sounds strange for us men, but this is not strange because they can really uh, use their intuition to see things that maybe we cannot. And we scientists, men scientists, not women scientists, but men scientists will have to develop mathematics and computational biology to understand the language that you can easily, you can easily see. Language. Then I started to be interested in language. So language is very, very interesting. This, this, uh, this paper, from this guy, uh, Ricard Soler, from Barcelona, is a fantastic scientist, uh, and he works a lot with these uh, networks of language. So you have a network here. If you take, for example, this text here from Virginia Woolf, and uh, you, you, just, you, you construct a network, and this network is based on, on, on the precedence. So what are the highest uh, the, the, the pieces in the text that are more important in terms of being linked to everybody? If you, if you do that, you use the degree centrality. I will explain degree centrality later. If you use the degree centrality to see that, you see that the particles like A, D, etc., are the, more, the most important particles in the text. But you can also construct a semantic, uh, semantic network. Instead of using the degree centrality, you use another centrality that is called between the centrality, which measures the flow of information inside the network. And then when you do that, you see that the verbs become more important. But you can use degree and between is and the other centralities to look at the language. And this, the, the, the paper is really fascinating. You can, you can for example, the se semantic networks can, can be built like this, for example. Uh, you can have hypo and hyperonomy, for example. A rose here, a rose is, uh, is a hyponym of a flower, and the flower is a hyperonym of a rose. So you can construct a network like this so that you would read the semantics and, 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 and see much better the semantics of the network than you see with the betweenness and with the degree centrality. Uh, the conclusion that Ricard gets is that language is between that. I mean, if you have a word, a sema, sema he means sema, uh, which is the origin of the word semi semiotics, is a meaning. Imagine that you have an object here, and you have several different words for this object. So it, it's very hard for the listener to understand what I'm talking about unless I have very many words, right? So as language developed in humans, uh, what, happen, what happens is that the words acquire not so many meanings, but a few meanings, and these few meanings make much easier for the listener to understand. On the other hand, if I start to talk to you, just like us scientists here, I start to talk to you words that have very specific meanings, it gets harder and harder for you to understand what I'm talking about. So communication is based on, on this equilibrium uh, and the evolution of language is that. My question is, where are plants? When plants read the environment, temperature, water, light, and they behave, can I find in the metabolites, in the genes, in the behavior, something that will be words that have meaning? If they do, if they do, if they exist, uh, where is the plant here? Is here or is there? We tend to think, we humans tend to think that the plants are here, but they're dumb, right? that they, they don't have any language, they don't express anything. I don't believe that. Now another thing, so leave this window open, and we'll come back to it. Bioenergy and sugarcane. At the same time, we were studying sugarcane. So CO2 enters the leaf, it's a different leaf from, from the hymenia. CO2 enters the leaf and we produce this sugar. 
just quickly going, we put, it, we put that plant in elevated CO2, and then it grows more and produces 30% more biomass, produces more sugar, so the plant is much better. So it's uh, spreading the sugar inside the plant in the form of sucrose. This is what we want, we want more bioenergy. And we look at the genes, and when we look at the genes, we see obviously that photosynthesis is up, secondary metabolism is up, so many different systems are, are perturbed by expressing more genes, or highly expressing some of the genes that are already expressed, or suppressing the expression of other genes. Metabolism also change. So again, the search is for the words in the plant language. Uh, you can get to that. Amanda, Amanda got to that in her PhD, so you, you can see all the network of, communi of uh, uh, communication among different uh, things, like if you have photos, when you put a plant in elevated CO2, you increase photosynthesis, you decrease malate, you, you increase this NADP, MDH, and then the genes for transport of electron, ele electrons are up. So when the genes it doesn't matter what is going on here for now. What matters is that when I put plant in elevated CO2, it increases the antenna to capture more light. And because it does that, it sucks more carbon, CO2, and produces more sugar. So can I, in, in terms of uh, synthetic biology, can I change that here? We already have four genes that are, uh, are in the way for, to be fully, fully sequenced or found in the genome of sugarcane that we are going to transform to see whether we can increase photosynthesis and, and deal with the system. On the other hand, we can also deal with growth in different ways, looking at the sugars, the accumulation of starch, etc., etc. Uh, one thing that is important as well is that, sorry, uh, the plant, this, this is the plant in the long term, this is a 75 day, 75 day experiment, but if you look at the plant in the 24 hours, uh, then you see other things. So in fact, this is the integration of several different 24 hours. And we usually have a lot of information in the leaves and not so much information in the stem and in the root. If we want to understand the systems, we would need to look at the entire plant. We need to look at the communication on the entire plant. And this is, this, we have already data on that. So in the end, integration uh, of the scales is very important. So the information, uh, the information in storage uh, and processing and execution is based on the genes that are there, how these genes are expressed, may proteins may metabolize. These metabolites will integrate themselves in chains that uh, are, uh, the proteins are put in a certain place in the, at a certain time in, under certain conditions that will process things like metabolic pathways to produce energy, to, to use energy, and then you have these functional modules that are several different systems that will make functions like, uh, when I say a function is a photosynthesis, the root is absorbing nutrients, the transport system of sucrose, whatever, it's all systems, and these systems have also to connect among themselves, right? And they, they will be like phrases in, in, in a text. And, and the red and the blue here could be the words that are linked. And the, there is a large, even a larger scale organization in the ecosystem that you have other types of functions. Well, organisms, and most of the networks in, uh, known are hierarchical networks. And in biology, uh, if we look, for example, at Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's for you to relax. This is beer, right? Uh, the, the, the beer or bread, if you want, you can see that the... the Transcription system, the metabolic system, and the protein system are all hierarchical networks. I'll show you better what is a hierarchical network. If you look now at the data that we collect in photosynthesis, it obeys the same law. It also, it, it also can be constructed as a, as, a, as a hierarchical network. 
So this is the kind of data that we get, but there's much more than that, and especially if you put the genes on, but this is just the physiology, just for you to have a look at the physiological parameters we use. 35 of them, Vinicius is the guy that is working on that, together with Amanda. So you, you have classes, you, you have here the biomass of the leaf, of the comb, this is sugarcane, right? Uh, then you have all the photosynthetic parameters, the sugars in, in, in uh, green here, the, all the, the, the light harvesting system here. This is the carbon harvesting system, this is the light harvesting system, and this is the at atomic level, how much nitrogen there is, how much carbon there is. What can I make with that? The method that we, we have been using, we have developing ourselves up to now, we take a full experiment for 75 days and we want to make one single image that could represent the entire experiment and the behavior of the plant using network. So what we do is uh, we, we make correlations pair to pair, all, all these parameters, uh, the, 30, the 35 variables, and then we, we use the statistics and we use a p-value, we cut it with a p-value, and then we establish a link based, a link between two parameters will be based on uh, statistical robustness that we can choose what it is. So, for example, if I take carbon, Carbon nitrogen, for example, the percentage of it correlate with the percentage of nitrogen. I'll make the person's correlation, and I'll have the p-value here, that is that, and so on and so forth. So here I have I, I chose this blue p-values to be the ones that I want to see, and these red p-values for me they're no good. There are no correlations. So then I make the links, and I exclude these links and I maintain the links that have the, 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 the correlation. So I come up with something like this, right? I have all the parameters here. Complicated, still, what, where should I look at? The way to look at is to look at the uh, centralities, like I said in the, in the uh, like, like I said, we were, Soled did in the language. For those of you that don't understand what's a centrality, take, for example, uh, the, the Last Supper, right? Uh, if you want to understand the Last Supper, you have the degree centrality. Jesus will receive links from Peter, James, Judah, uh, and Matthew, right? So the highest degree centrality in this network would be Jesus with four linkages, okay? Four, four links. And Peter, uh, Peter, three links is an important guy as well. Matthew, another three links could be looking at the picture. Okay, very precise. I'm not so precise here. I'm talking in general. Uh, but now, if I, if I, this is the degree centrality. Now, if I look, for example, who is more important? If I want to get to Jesus, who is the best friend of Jesus? It's Peter, right? So everyone here that would like to get to Jesus would talk first to Peter. So Peter has higher between the centrality in relation to Jesus. So he's a very important guy as well. There are many other centralities, but this is just an example. Uh, so if I want to understand who is attracting more links, like in the language, the particles A and D, uh, the articles are, are the most important. Or if I want to understand semantics, if I want to understand better semantics, I can go to between us, right? This is, this, is the, this is what I said before. So now, if we look at the centralities, for example, the between us centrality of the network for sugarcane, in a 75-day experiment, so in, in red here, you have the highest between the centrality in ambient CO2 and in elevated CO2. And you see the plant changes. Here it has the GS, that is uh, the opening or not the stomata, so the plant is dealing, uh, which means that the plant is dealing with water, right? It doesn't matter the other colors because I don't have time to, to explain here, but look just at the between the centralities. The degree centralities, the degree centralities are the, trans, the level of transparency that you see in the network here. And, uh, but ne then if I, if I elevate the CO2, the plant will start to focus on the height and the biomass, just like I see the behavior 
uh, in, the, in, in my experiment. Okay, so this we don't know yet, but this seems we are still working on that. We are trying to apply with Roberto, leave one out and other techniques to, to check the robustness of that, but the robustness, the statistical robustness is, is okay for now. Uh, but I told you also that the plant is another one during one day. And this, this is a very nice example of the same plant. And you can see here, this is A is photosynthesis, a sugarcane plant during one day. This is during the day. The gray here is during the night. So you can see that photosynthesis obviously is up during the day and down during the night. But you can see here, this is the starch. It builds the starch. And as the night comes, it will degrade the starch and use. And this is raffinose and sucrose. That is the most important thing in sugarcane. You see that sucrose picks in the leaves and then decreases. This is leaf, stem, stem, and root. So we are now looking at the entire plant. And we can see more. So this is where the big data starts to come in. This is, this is 91 metabolites that I can see in, in all the cells in the leaves, in the stem, and in the comb, right? So what this, is, this tells me, this graph here, tells me somehow what's going on inside the cells. Uh, if we can look at that in this way, I can construct little clocks and see what's going on at every different hour, looking at the substances, and I see that cellulose metabolism is there uh, in the afternoon, synthesis of hemicellulose during the day, cell expansion during the night. This is in the leaf, but this is different in the roots, right? And the stem in this experiment, uh, this, this uh, was not read yet, but we have accumulation of sucrose and the decrease of sucrose and glucose, etc. So here we can see that there might be signaling systems which is probably related to sugar transport that is signaling among organs. So one organ is talking actually to each other through uh, these signals that are produced depending on the metabolism. Okay, so if I, if I look at now with the network at the metabolism, I'll see a thing like this. And the network, I can, I can see that the link, looking at positioning the, the nodes that are more linked to the other on the basis of degree centrality, I can see that here the leaves in green and the root is in red and in blue is the stem. So we can see that they really separate, that they are more connected. So you can see different uh, uh, connectivities, levels of connectivities among organs. This is obvious, right? But we can, we can actually see metabolically, what kind of meta metabolisms the different organs have. And they are actually different, right? They, they are not the same because these this, uh, nodes here are not the same thing. They are different things. And I can see here degree centrality is a, an amino acid. And I can see the between the centrality, centrality that's a strange thing. This is mannose which is related to the synthesis of proteins, for example. Then I can look at the night metabolisms and look at the centrality. The centrality in the night is, one, is different from the, the general centrality. Still amino acids and synthesis of protein, but there is a bias here because this is what I measure. And then this is where we are now. We are trying to understand that and how we can use that to understand the behavior of a full experiment looking at the metabolism and looking at the physiology. But there is one problem. How these levels communicate? How metabolism communicates with physiology, which communicates the different organs? So we, for the, the Microsoft Research for PESP, uh, project, we chose sorghum. Why? Because sorghum, sorghum is an important feed in bioenergy. The genome is completely sequenced. It's, it has a simple genet uh, genetics. It's just a, a, de a deployed uh, uh, genome. The genome is similar to sugarcane, so I can extrapolate the sugarcane and use for bioenergy and for food as well. 
Uh, it closes the life cycle in relatively short time. About four months, a plant of sorghum will flower and produce seeds. So I could add another dimension to the experiments that I couldn't add uh, for sugarcane and for hymenia, because for hymenia, to wait for a flower and a seed will take 25 years. For sugarcane, it takes about a year. Here in four months, I can close the cycle and I can understand not only the, the, not only the talk between the organs, but also along the development and how a pregnant plant behaves if it changes the language when it becomes pregnant, right? So the idea in our project is, is that, is that we, would, we would look at the different levels, the interscale levels uh, and the intrascale levels in leaves, stem and root, uh, and try to connect that. This is not trivial, and this is where the big data come, from, come, come, come in the game, right? Because we are going to have about uh, one or well, maybe three million sequences of RNA. Now we can measure 400 molecules in the metabolomics at a time, 500. So we are going to have uh, 1,500 uh, or uh, at least 10 times more metabolomics than you saw before in these networks. So what kind of mathematics or what kind of computing, uh, computing science that we, we are going to, to use in this case? So we started the experiment. What we have in uh, La Fieco is that we are increasing more and more the, the uh, sensors that we have. And you can see here that we, we can measure different things like measuring well, photosynthesis. We can, we can actually measure uh, how much water there is in the soil and how what the water is going down. The idea of the experiment with sorghum is to take water out uh, in a certain point and see how, it, how the plant will respond uh, when and it doesn't have water and has higher CO2, which is the scenario that we expect for climate change. Uh, so, this, for you to have an idea, we, we, chase, we chase the plants and we look at every leaf. When every leaf appears, this is 80 days experiment. This is a preliminary experiment that is already going on. Uh, and it, we can see, we are checking everything. Uh, what is the level of photosynthesis of every leaf of the plant? Is the stomata open in every leaf of the plant? This is just preparing things. We can see the, the, the height of the plant increasing here. Here we suspended water and we are seeing what happens. Obviously the, the, the height becomes the same, it stays the same. And this, this is an example of the sensor. For example, when I suspended the water uh, from the vase, this uh, records for me the water going down. Whereas here you can see when I add water, every time I, wad, I add water and uh, what happens in the vase. This is what happens in your house. Right? Uh, when, you, when you add uh, uh, water. If you don't add water, the plant will die because it goes here. And there is this very interesting bumps here that is that the plant during the night will take some of the water from the atmosphere and, and, and uh, actually water the soil, its own soil. Right? So it's, this, this is a, a, a very nice phenomenon that uh, was recently discovered. So the basic idea of our project uh, is in fact, it's a very challenging, is that we, we use these uh, uh, three variables, water, temperature, and CO2, and look at them at different organs, and then uh, different tissues and cells, if possible. It, it is already possible to look at the redundancy, the redundancy of cells to see if a tissue is, res is responding differently or not. We can cut this with a laser and look at the gene expression, metabolism, etc and then integrate in, in this. So uh, this, this is the basic, the, the basic idea. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, mathematics. There's very, very little in the literature about scale interaction. We find, uh, I found, very, very little. So we probably would need the help of mathematics, uh, not only computing science, but mathematics as well, and then apply this uh, to develop, develop visualization systems that can drive us to understand better what's, what's in there. Uh, these are the collaborators. Uh, Roberto, is, uh, Roberto is part of that. And uh, our guard, Angel, since the beginning has been uh, uh, Juliana. I don't know if Juliana is here. 
I didn't, I didn't see her yet, yesterday. But without, without, uh, Juliana, uh, without Juliana, we wouldn't have the project because she was really very keen with the idea and helped us a lot since the beginning, making very, very interesting questions from, from a lay person because she's not from, from biology and helped us a lot to develop uh, the project. So that's it. Uh, uh, and you, you may contact me if you, if you can help me, please, uh, with something on the computing science and the mathematics. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have time for some questions. Uh, First of all, I'm fascinated with, fascinated with, with your work. Uh, we have a growing school in Colombia in metabolic reconstructions and topological analysis and flux balance analysis of metabolic networks. Uh, and and in, 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 especially in, in plant pathogen interactions. So my question goes in that direction. Uh, since you're trying to evaluate or to see how the different variables climatic variables uh, affect the plant development and, and so on. And the, if, if, if I didn't misunderstood your, your, your <laughs> presentation, what you're doing is trying to figure out how these variables uh, affect the communication process between different organs. And organs and it's, it's more the flux of information. So my question is, have you, have you or, or do you have in mind uh, to approach the same problem, but looking at the metabolism itself, I mean, like, how's this flux of information in the metabolism as, as, as a whole? I mean, uh, how metabolite A goes to metabolite B through some reaction by means of a metabolic reconstruction based on geno uh, genomic scale or perhaps a transcriptome scale metabolic reconstruction. Uh, do, do you have these in, in, in your pants or how do you think that? Um, you, you're, you're speaking about uh, uh, phase transition in the system, right? Metabolic phase transition. Yeah, so actually, it, actually with, 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 the, with the, the huge amount of information you have, it could be a lot of things uh, you have a lot of information. For instance, uh, you have 35 variables and you also have uh, information or differential expression information for several time points, as I could see. Uh, it could be a dynamic study of the metabolic phenotypes for each uh, stage. Uh, yeah, it could be a phase transition, it could be a study of the dynamic of the, of the evolution of the network through the time of flux of the information through the network through the time. Well, what we are trying to do is to provoke the plant using this uh, system that we have. If you give more CO2, because CO2 is so important for the plant, so uh, I was talking about phase transition because uh, you have a status, a, met a metabolic phenotype if you want, and uh, during during one day, because we have to look at we have to integrate the plant in one day because the plant is uh, is an organism. Uh, so uh, phase transition. Uh, what I mean by that is that when I provoke the plant, change in the temperature, change in CO two, I will uh, what what kind of changes in the semantics of the communication among organs. In your case, the microorganism and the and the plant, what kind of changes in the semantics? What I what I believe could be helpful, uh, as I said in the beginning, from my naive point of view, is that the centralities could be a very nice way to see, just like we see in language, if we if we can pinpoint these these uh, things that are more important than others from different angles, maybe we can sort of. Uh, uh, clean uh, all the, this data uh, and, and look at the most important, meaningful data that the plant is using to communicate. This doesn't mean that we, we wouldn't need to produce all this data, right? Because if I don't produce the da this data, I don't, I don't have access to the, to the degree centrality between the centrality and, clo and close the centrality. So we, we have to continue to produce data in, in the different levels.
Hello, uh, I'm from Computer Science, and you say that you you need help to compute some some things. You no, it's it's not clear for for us, mm. I believe, but it's a common practice in computer science, and you share data sets, mm -hmm. and it, I believe it's a it's a it's a good idea. How do you say that the the, the example of betweenness, mm -hmm. degree and central degree? is some kind similar to complex network and recommend a system like in the Facebook to recommend a friend. And uh, sometimes it's hard on computer science to find a data set that could be useful. So the same data set is, uh, is used for uh, thousands of students and it's stays on a thousand of papers. And you can't contribute in other, in other areas because you don't have the data set. And even the, if you it's a good idea to share the data set. And the ex now it's put a paper, the data set on the site and say, what's the target? And I believe that a lot of people can help just doing their job and could be useful. This would be great. Uh, what we have, I, I presented just a, uh, a very small part of the data we have. We, we have already studied uh, 15 species. So we have a, a huge amount of data that we are trying to organize together with Roberto in the NAP system and the PRONEX. Roberto is the coordinator of, uh, of this uh, project at the University of Sao Paulo of computing science applied to biology. And uh, the idea that we have, we are preparing, uh, because we biologists are sort of disorganized with data, right? We produce lots of these spreadsheets and things and we leave it in the computer and then, as was said yesterday, the, the, the version is, disappears and then you get crazy and you go to a computer science to recover that. So the idea is the, of, of the integration that we have, uh, computer science and biology at the University of Sao Paulo is that we would put this data in, in such a way that we could share that uh, with other scientists and get more and more of that. Uh, so in the future, maybe we could look at the betweenness, uh, are the betweennesses of the networks, metabolic networks of the Amazon different from the Atlantic forest? Are, are soybean different from sugarcane looking at this, these experiments and these behaviors? That's, but this, this, is, this is really, you are you're absolutely correct. We, share, we have to share that if we want to, ev to evolve. Oh, yes, okay, me. this was a great talk as usual. Um, I noticed that in your chain of interactions, even though you kind of mentioned them, uh, you did not talk about humans in the sense that plants will uh, react differently according to the way, I'm not talking about the way they are treated because you talked about women will talk to plants and men will ignore them. <laughs> I it's not what I, going to I mean, but the way, uh, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but manejo, okay? So uh -huh. the way you, Management. you treat, uh -huh. manage, um, you treat the soil, you protect the plant from sun, whatever it are. So how does kind of, of, of interaction enter in your studies? Uh, in, in, in our studies, for the time being, uh, we, don't, we don't have that. I'm, I'm starting to study that on the bioenergy side. We are starting to, to, to do some work on the decision making in bioenergy, which has something uh, indirectly related, uh, indirectly in a very nice way, indirectly related to what's going on in the food and all these metabolisms. Uh, but we, di we, did we didn't think, but this scale will be very important. I don't know, maybe some, somebody in the audience can help, but I, maybe there are a lot, well, the, the systems, the sy general systems theory, what it really says, Bertalanffy, 1950 says, is that there are laws, there you have, we have the laws of the physics and the chemistry, but when you go to biology, sociology, and, uh, 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 atmospheric uh, sciences, uh, you, there are new laws that physics does not have. That, that's the system's laws. So I think by looking at the scales, if at this scale we could discover some details of these laws, how it's working, maybe we could apply to the other laws and then I think the, the interaction with uh, the work you do, for example, with, with these interactions would be much easier. That's my hope. I'm fascinated by 
and the things you talked about in your experiments with elevated CO2 uh, and sorghum. Thank so you. So sorghum is, 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 I mean, biologists also study things like, very simple things like C. elegans. So sorghum is, is clearly much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. But you do have the genomic information and you, you can look at the, the leaves, the plants and the roots, mm -hmm. the stems and the roots. Uh, what would be the goal when you understand this? Would you, would you be able to do some genetic engineering or synthetic biology with it? Is that your ultimate goal? I've, I forgot to mention, in fact, uh, the two, two persons on the bottom of my slide are Eleni Carrer and Anna Alonso. Anna is a metabolic engineer at uh, Ohio State University, and Eleni is our uh, transformer person in the, in the project in the INCT. So uh, we are now sending uh, next Monday a proposal to get some money to, to work together. Anna is going to do the metabolomics and uh, transcriptomics will be done with Maria and Franz Lewis uh, so that having the genes, our idea is to use sorghum. I think sorghum will probably go together with sugarcane into the synthetic biology. So the idea is really to find these systems, look at the betweenness, look at the genes that are related to the betweenness, the metab metabol metabolites, and the genes that are related to the betweenness, betweennesses or degrees, and then try to change these genes to see if we can change the semantics. So y your communication networks with betweenness and centrality, is that related to metabolic pathways? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, some of uh, the that's why I showed the metabolic uh, network here, because we you you can uh, transform that in metabolic pathways. So this would be very tricky because we have to, if we look at the uh, centrality, what kind of transformation we we would have to use engineering skills, in fact, to see what kind of transformation we have we can make that will change the behavior of the plant without. Uh, killing it or uh, avoiding that it, uh, it grows. No, sounds fascinating. Can I pick up on that? If you look at the genes uh, in uh, uh, high betweenness, with high betweenness, is it, isn't it true, although I'm not a biologist, that these would be influencing more than one process, more than one metabolic pathway at once, because they are in between different pathways? And if you change those, yeah. you are changing a lot of things in the plant at once. And wouldn't it be interesting to see the low between us ones and see if sure. particular processes can be changed, I don't know, one at a time maybe, sure. or ten at a time? Uh, sorry, uh, it's just yeah, no, my you're, you're, you're network view correct. on top of some of the work in biology we are also uh, exploring. We choosing, choosing the between us will be within this uh, this uh, engineering, uh, engineering skills that we have to use because, for example, if I take, we already know that if you take, for example, Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis, uh, you find uh, full collections of mutants. But there are certain genes that there is no mutant. Why? I think because they're very high between us or high degree. So if you, if you, this mutant does not exist because it does not exist, because you just cut communication inside the plant. So uh, looking at the scales of the centralities, not only closeness could be quite important to look. Other, other centralities will be very important to look, but then uh, I'm not talking about that because then you would, I would have to even draw it, to draw a plant and see, well, the closeness will be, how, t how you get there faster, not only the communication. So uh, I believe that uh, looking at these, I believe now that uh, looking at the centralities, and you are absolutely correct, we can l try not only the low between us, but all the, cha the chain of between us and other centralities to l and look, I think what we have that is, uh, can, can be quite nice is this way of doing in experiments because very few people, I, I know very few people or no, no people actually that do experiments like we do. Every experiment we do, uh, for example, say the full cycle is four months, like we are going to do on sorghum. The four months, and then we do the four months, and then we do two crosses that I say, 24 hours. 
uh, and we have all this data. Uh, we know the name of every plant, as you said, as you saw. Um, we know the name of every plant so that we can come back the data and we would have spreadsheets that could be shared. And if he is using my data, he, he probably could go there and, and even look at a picture of the plant to see uh, or a film or something like this. So th this, is, this is the idea of looking at the system when we transform and take down a centrality. Uh, then we, could, we should be able to look at the systems. Then you could design visualization systems that will be really fantastic, I think. Sure, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, more questions? Maybe we, we can conclude. There is a coffee break now. Thank you very much, Marcos. Thank you very much. Uh,